Hey all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen right now. So welcome uh, to our talk today about uh, hacking misconfigured Kubernetes. My name is Oro Kamara, and I'm a senior development team lead here at SNCC. For those of you who are not familiar with SNCC, SNCC is a developer first security company that helps developer use open source. And as part of it, we offer security uh, solutions for the cloud for cloud native applications, including open source dependency scanning, container scanning, and, and lately we also released a new a new official product for infrastructure as code scanning. Uh, before SNCC, uh, I worked in the government of Israel, and that's it. So, what exactly are we going to talk about today? Um, so, we're going to do a really short. A kind of intro, uh, but a really short one about the, the, the potential problems and the uh, cloud attack vectors, just as a background. Then we will continue uh, to talk about three different issues as part of the Kubernetes configuration. Uh, we will not do a, a huge uh, drill down into each one of them, but uh, we will just show how easy it is to fix uh, different potential problems that you can have in production. So we'll start by talking about security contexts, and then we'll talk about resources limitation. And, and yeah, let's start. So, so again, like we, we, we have the cloud, uh, like multiple attack vectors in, in, in the cloud uh, attack vector in the cloud environment. So why is it so complicated? And basically, I wanted to start with uh, an example. Probably you are all familiar with this one, the attack uh, on Capital One. Uh, I think it was almost like one and a half year ago. Uh, it was a really, really big one. Affected one million uh, users only in the U.S. and around like one one hundred million dollars uh, in costs. And I think it's a really, really good example to start with because um, it's kind of uh, an, an example for misconfiguration that was part of the attack, but also a good example for the amount of potential uh, security pitfalls that we all should be aware of. Um, and for those of you I'm not, who are not too familiar with this attack, so there were like multiple steps uh, that helped the attacker. Uh, part of them were like misconfigured load load balancer, and we also add like uh, a server side request uh, uh, for forgery uh, vulnerability, like SSR SSR vulnerability in the application. And, and in addition, we also add like an over permissive S3 bucket on AWS. So all of those together basically help the attacker while doing uh, uh, while doing uh, the the attack. So now let's talk a little bit, just a little bit about the ownership of the de developers those, those days. Uh, and basically, what does my service contain? Uh, so obviously, we, uh, as we all know, we have the source code of my application. So uh, you can see right now uh, an example for my uh, Python app. And of course, I need to make sure that all of my code is secure, that I'm, I'm writing like, like good code. Um, and then we have third-party dependencies. So in this example, I just installed few packages as part of my requirements TXT. And of course, then I need to make sure that each one of those dependencies is secured as well. And we then we're taking the uh, like the application and we wrap it with our Docker file. And we in order to build Docker image, uh, in this case, we just took the Python 3 base image. Uh, we and we, you know, run some get, uh, update and install commands, and then we have our own uh, Docker image for the application. And of course, that as part of this Docker file and the Docker image, we need to make sure that all the OS dependencies are secured as well. Exactly like we need to make sure that the dependencies of, our, of the application are secured. And then we we have the uh, the platform, right? We need to make sure that all the infrastructure as code files are secured. In this case, we have just an example for a Terraform file, um, and again, just another thing to make sure uh, uh, we, and to make and to, to take care of. And last but not least, what we're going to talk about today: Kubernetes file. 
In this, in this example, you can see just a, a deployment YAML for my uh, Kubernetes configuration. But basically, there are lots of things to, to take care and like no, lots of knowledge that are part of the Kubernetes configuration. Yeah, basically lots of things to handle uh, and good luck, Mr. Developer. Uh, so now let's start talking about uh, the, uh, the security context which is part of Kubernetes configuration. So let's start with a simple, very simple definition for it. So what security context is, is basically, basically defines privilege and access control setting for the pod or the container. So here is my uh, like pod configuration. And as you can see right now, I also have the uh, security context, a, a special section for the security context uh, and under that, you can see several options like privilege or capabilities. And we're going to talk about each one of those, of those today. So let's start with privilege pods. So when exactly do we need privilege pods? Think, think about scenarios where your application need to access the host resources, uh, cases like, um, like, uh, like, uh, accessing the GPU, the graphic card, or manipulating the, the network stack. For all of those, you actually need to access the resources that are part of the host. And I think that the security risk is clear here. Basically, each one of the, of the processes inside the privileged pods, the privileged container, is basically exactly the same like a root process on the host. And in other words, it means that an attacker can basically do anything they want. Um, so the solution is simple as well. So then just, if you don't need it, just don't use it. So uh, don't turn it into, into true. And of course, again, there are some cases where you can use this option, of course, but you, you need to be aware of the consequences. So now let's start with the demo, with a nice demo. Uh, in this demo, we have two different applications. The first one is supposed to be supposed to be a secure uh, payment application, uh, and again, it's supposed to be secure because it's it's supposed to be isolated as well. And the only thing this application does is just to write files to the disk. The name of the file in this case is like uh, uh, and it is is uh, cards JSON. And basically, whenever uh, a user pays something using the payment application, we just write the details um, to the cards JSON file. Again, very dummy application, but is like our example. And the second, the second application is our vulnerable application. So as part of this application, we have two, two different problems. The first one is that we have uh, an RCE vulnerability. In this application, RC stands for remote code execution. So basically, think about an option for the attacker to run code from the outside on the pod itself. Uh, so this is like the RCE vulnerability. But also, the main problem and the, uh, that we're going to talk about is uh, that this vulnerability, uh, this uh, application, as is a is running inside a privileged pod. So again, we have, we have our node, and inside this our node, we have those two uh, applications. Basically, uh, because both of them uh, run on the, same, on the same node, they basically use the same Docker engine, which means that uh, the Docker layers are, store, are stored on the, in the same uh, local storage. So in our case, if an attacker has an access to the vulnerable pod, they can basically access all the files of the of the other supposed to be secured application and now let's see that so let's just see the uh the um, the application itself so this is like the the vulnerable application and as part of this application i can basically upload pictures into into this page and now I want to use the payment application. So I'm going to donate $1 and I'm going to, I'm going to show you my secret credit card. And that's it. We basically donated $1. 
let's see what's going on in our uh, in our environment, in our Kubernetes. So I'm going to run uh, kubectl get pods. And this is our two pods. We have like the one for the deployment and the one for the payment. And now let's let's let, let's take a look on the the configuration themselves. So this is the configuration of the payment application. Nothing too spatial here. But this is the configuration of our regular vulnerable application, and you can see that the pod is is privileged. And now let's try to act this application. So again, we're gonna assume that there is an RC application, uh, RC vulnerability as part of this application, and basically the the RC that we're gonna use is kind of a, an option to upload a PHP script. Into the, into the application and then access this PHP script. And then we can use this PHP script in order to run commands on the pod. So first of all, we're gonna upload the PHP script, which we're gonna see in a second. Then we're gonna create, we're gonna access this PHP script using carol command and we're gonna run mkdir in order to create a directory. We're gonna mount the host file system and then we're going to look for the file that we're interested in. So this is like our PHP script. And as you can see, I can get an argument and run it as a system. And now let's try to upload this file. So I'm going to upload again the PHP script. And now let's inspect this page and take the name of this file. So now the only thing I need to do is to run a curl command and to access this file from the outside. So now let's copy this curl command. And the first thing we're gonna do again is to create a new directory on the host, on the, on the pod, I'm sorry. So this is, so basically the, the upper uh, terminal is, uh, is, is a kubectl is uh, exec into our pod just so we understand what exactly is going on. As you can see, I have, I have nothing in the temp directory. And on the, on the lower terminal, this is the attacker environment. So as you can see, we run the make their, make their command and we now have a new directory named host. Now what we're gonna do is to run a mount command and, the, and we can do it only because th this pod is privileged. So before we run the command, we had nothing under temp host, and now we have multiple directory. So those are the directories from the host itself. Next thing you want to do is to look for all the, the files named card JSON. Again, let's just assume that I already know that uh, the name of the file with a secret credit card that would name is, is a card JSON. And the last command we're going to run is just a cut command in order to display the content of this file. And as you can see, this is the credit card we just entered uh, in, in the payment application. And now let's see how we can fix it. So simple as that. You see, just turn the true into false. I have a cleanup script, so we basically uh, deleted all the pods, and now we're gonna build everything again. I'm gonna refresh my application, so you can see that we'll start from from scratch. And let's start. To, let's try to do exactly the same. Let's start by uploading the PHP script into the platform, and then we're gonna run the same commands one by, one by one. So again, let's let's look for all the the new pods. You can see that uh, they they started uh, 20, 28 seconds ago. Let's execute into one in, into the deployment pod, and let's see that there, that we have nothing under the temp directory. And now we're gonna run the uh, make the make the command. Just a second. Sorry for that, and, and as you can see, right now we have uh, the uh, we have nothing under the the host, the temp host directory, 
And now this is the interesting part. So now we're gonna run the mount command and we still have nothing under the temp host directory. Let's try to understand why. So we're gonna run the mount command, not as an attacker this time, but just inside the pod itself. And you can see that we, uh, we got permission denied error. And basically we got this error only because, um, because the, the pods are not privileged anymore. Uh, so that, that was it about privileged pods. And now let's continue with our uh, second topic. And the second topic is boot containers. So when exactly do we need to run, uh, we, do we need to run containers with uh, root users? So basically almost each and every scenario, uh, think about cases when you need to install system packages or when you need to change part of the configuration and um, even simple commands like ping, for all of those, you actually need uh, uh, root privileges. And, and the security risk is kind of similar to what we had uh, with the privileged pods, maybe a little bit like lower, like it's, it's like privileged pod is basically, okay, and you can do, you can do anything, um, but uh, root service, uh, root uh, containers, it's, uh, it's, it's still, still very risky because uh, the attacker can, for example, access the files or if, if they want to explore the network and check other devices on the same, in the same network. Um, so they have those options. And I think that, you know, one of the problems here with uh, root containers is that we can easily forget or miss the fact that our images can run as root. So even in this Docker file, in this example, you see that we have um, a base image of, of PHP. And, and I did nothing special. I, I mentioned nothing related to, uh, to the user itself. But even then, when I will run the uh, UMI command, I will see that I, I'm running as a root. Um, so again, this is like uh, something that we all need to be aware of because there are lots of images, images that we probably can use, like base images that we can use as part of the uh, of the of, of building the, uh, the our images, uh, and in part of them we can have root users. And I will see uh, two different solutions. Okay, those are not like the only solutions, but two different solutions that we uh, that we have for um, uh, for root containers. The first one is kind of a, like an old legacy Linux solution, which is like the Linux capabilities. And basically, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, like um, the kernel, Linux kernel uh, added lots of capabilities in order to allow the process to start uh, as root and then to drop the, the, um, the privileges as quickly as possible. So this is like the, the original uh, the, was the orig original solution. In our case, in Kubernetes, it's basically, we can basically use Linux capabilities as an option to grant a very specific permission, permissions, list of permissions to our application. Um, so basically, this is how we can uh, prevent granting a full, a full root access for the application. So my recommendation here will be, you know, just start by dropping all the capabilities and then gradually, gradually one by one, you can add those that uh, application actually actually needs. Uh, and and let's try it out. So in this example, we're going to use the same uh, Docker file that we just uh, the same image that we just saw. It's like a PHP image, and you, as you can see, I'm, I'm I'm not running as a privileged pod. And now let's say that the attacker uh, got an access to my pod. So maybe one of the things that I want to do is to explore the network. So one of the, uh, of the common uh, tools that can be used is NMAP. NMAP is basically a, a free network scanner that can help the attacker to explore the network. And here you, you can see that we run nmap and we got the ip of the of the payment service and of course that we can ping it, ping this uh, service as well and just assume that maybe you know maybe we have a vulnerability 
and this is how we can access somehow uh, or exploit the, into the uh, into the payment uh, application. So now let's see how we can drop all the capabilities of this of this image and and how it can help us. So again, let's start by dropping all the capabilities. And then I want to clean up all my environment and rebuild again. So as you can see uh, in the lower terminal, we now have uh, new pods that are being created. And let's try to, to do exactly the same. Let's execute inside into the into the the, the, the pod. We're gonna run if config in order to get our IP. And then we're going to run again the, the Nmap tool. This time we got a fail to open uh, the device. And even if we'll, st we'll try to do ping, we'll get uh, uh, operation not, we, we, got, we just got operation not permitted. And the reason for that is basically that Nmap sends and receive raw packets. Um, and this is why when we drop the capabilities, all the capabilities. We also drop the the capability name uh, capnet raw, and so we uh, we kind of disable for nmap the option to receive those packets, and this is why we can use, we cannot use it anymore. And now let's see our second and uh, second option here, and the second option is our second uh, maybe the second solution is to try uh, the option for run is non root. Uh, so run is non root is basically an option uh, that might help you to might help you to uh, de to determine uh, whenever the container should run as uh, as non as as non root user, and basically behind the scenes, Kubernetes will not let you to start the container uh, if it asks to if the container itself uh, asks to run as root, and the recommendation if you, if you know that the pod or the application should not run as a root, just turn it on. And let's see how exactly uh, it works. So again, we're gonna use exactly the same environment. This time we're gonna uh, disable the capabilities feature and turn the run is non root option. I'm gonna clean up the environment again and rebuild everything. And this time in the lower uh, terminal, you can see that I have a problem uh, and the status is create container uh, config error. Let's try to understand what exactly happened. So I'm going to run a kubectl describe command. And you can see that I have an error that the container uh, tried to use root container. So basically, because the container was root, like the user of the container was root, Kubernetes helped us by blocking this, this container from running. Uh, okay, that was it about, um, uh, about uh, privileged pods and also about root containers. And next thing we're gonna talk about are resources limitation. Uh, so it's kind of a different type of security, security issue. Because uh, I think that resource, limit, resource limitation is a good example for the default behavior in Kubernetes configuration that we all should be aware of. And let's, let's start talking about that. So, uh, so we have two types of resources. We have uh, CPU and memory, of course. And, and again, the problem is that by default, all the pods run with unbounded limits. And it basically means that a single pod can consume as much as CPU and memory uh, that are available on a specific node. And of course that Kubernetes might kill application or even nearby application inside uh, the same node. So of course, as you all know, uh, defaults are never good. And this is why you need to manually uh, make sure that you, we have proper resources, uh, both for the requests, but even more, specific, even more important than the, lim the limits. And and now let's let's talk about like the CPU and the and the memory. So I think that the CPU is maybe you know the the I think the easy case because 
because of the throttling mechanism as part of Kubernetes uh, that occurs each and every time the, the application hits the, the CPU limit, so Kubernetes will not ter terminate our applications if we will hit the, the CPU limit. The worst case scenario in, in, in like the in the CPU with the CPU is that it will affect only the performance. So everything might run slower, right? With memory, it's a bit different. Um, so we cannot compress memory. And this is why pods will be terminated once we reach the, the memory limit. So think about scenarios where you know someone, the attacker, can, uh, can run a DOS attack. On your application, in this case, if if they will, you know, uh, uh, they will use all the memory as part of this application, they might block legitimate users from using using the, the our application. But thinking about like even a worse, uh, much worse case where you might have different applications running on the same node, and an attacker try to attack one of the applications but at the end they also blocked the the second application that is running on same on the same node because at the end both of them are using uh the the same memory same memory resources and now let's see an example for that uh, so in this demo we're gonna have uh, again like two two different applications again running on the same node uh we will have the innocent application and and the, and this application should not be affected, you know, by any other applications. Again, this is this is only uh, the trivial assumption. Um, and we also have on the same node, we also have our vulnerable application. Uh, and when we'll start the demo, we'll, we'll uh, we will run this application without any uh, resource limitation, without any limitation of the memory, and and we also gonna assume that the this application contains a vulnerability kind of a uh, that will help the attacker as part of the DOS attack so the attacker can use this vulnerability in order to, in order to take more resources from the pod um, and and the, again the problem is that uh, the attacker can use the vulnerability in order to take the, those resources and then uh, they will affect the innocent app as well so let's see. So, um, so this is our uh, like our two deployments. So we will start without any resource limitation. This is our like, uh, and this is like our uh, innocent app. So as you can see, for each one of the app, we can see how much uh, how much available memory we have. And let, now let's go to the vulnerable app and let's assume that we can run the DOS attack and we can consume, let's start with uh, 100 megabytes. And you can see that there is a drop in the amount of, of, uh, of, uh, of available memory. Again, we ran it for five seconds. So now let's do even you know, a drastic step and you, can, you will now see even a faster drop in the amount of available memory. So again, that was our problem. We had uh, like two different applications and we saw how one of them uh, without any resource limitation can affect the, the other application. Uh, and now let's see how we can solve it. So I'm gonna turn on the resource limitation. I limited uh, the number of memory. And again, I'm gonna clean up my environment and rebuild it again. Let's wait for the new pods. Yeah. Okay, so now let's let's try to see those two applications again. And let's start with a, a smaller size this time. So you see that I managed to allocate uh, 10 megabytes, but when I try to allocate more than that, like 100 megabytes, which is more than the limit, I just failed to allocate this amount of, of, uh, of uh, memory. 
So again, a very, very simple solution, um, uh, but it's all very important as part of taking care for all of the applications that are running on your, on your environment, on your production environment. Okay, so now let's go uh, to some conclusions and maybe you know, what, are the, uh, what are the things that you, you can take from this talk? Uh, so what did we talked about? We, we talked about the uh, a little bit about the ownership of the devel developers those days and how complex it is to make sure uh, that everything is secure as part of our pipeline. Um, and then we started to talk about three different issues that are part of Kubernetes uh, configuration, three different security issues that are part of the uh, Kubernetes configuration. Uh, the first one was privilege pod, and then we continue with root containers. We saw two different solution, uh, solutions for root containers, and then we continue with kind of a different problem um, of, of security, uh, of first of all, having no limitations, but also uh, using the default values of Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes security is hard, but definitely doable. And I think that, um, you know, that developers should be, they should start getting familiar with those issues. They should start getting uh, familiar with those risks because it's, uh, as we all understand now, it's kind of an inseparable part of the application, right? You can, you can just say, okay, this is my code and this is my dependencies and I've no idea what's going on on my Kubernetes environment. Uh, it's all part of the same application. And I guess that, you know, one of the things we, we, we need to make, uh, to make sure is that there is a good education and we all uh, will all be familiar with those risks as part of Kubernetes. And, and maybe, uh, maybe another kind of a, a takeaway from this talk is the fact that we need to help the developers and it's kind of related to the previous slide, we need to help the developers by adding more tools to the pipeline. Um, and more specifically, I'm talking about, uh, to, uh, about the fact that we need to, uh, to catch those issues as soon as possible, not waiting for the last moment and see those issues on production, but to, to find them as soon as possible, even during the, de the development, and to fix them. Um, and, uh, what didn't we talked about today? So lots of other stuff that uh, we probably missed. Um, again, we don't have too much time today, so uh, I will not talk about each one of those, um, but uh, there is a great list of other issues that uh, you should all be familiar with. Uh, things like, uh, like uh, RBAC, like role-based access control, and, but also networks, uh, network policies, all of those uh, have a specific context, it's a specific uh, value that you can use in order to improve the security as part of your, um, the, the security uh, as part of your uh, Kubernetes environment. Uh, so last but not least, I would like to, uh, to show you one of the solutions that we uh, released uh, lately as part of SNCC Infra, uh, which named SNCC Infra code. Uh, and basically, sneak infrastructure as code helps you to find and even fix security issues as part of your configuration files. And right now we support uh, Elm, Kubernetes, and Terraform files. And we're basically uh, uh, making this list even bigger and bigger. And um, you can scan everything from your Git environment. You can scan everything locally using our, uh, our CLI. And uh, you even have an option to filter out policies uh, that you don't agree with. Like if you don't agree with the severity, if you think that one of the policies that we think that is very low, you think it's very important and you want to make sure that, um, that, um, that all, your, all the developers in the organization are taken care of so you can change it to be an high severity, um, high severity uh, um, policy. So I don't like those two slides. I'm just gonna jump directory, uh, directly into our uh, uh, sneak project page. Uh, so this is like sneak environment, this is like sneak platform. And I already imported like, with, like using GitHub, I already imported 
um, my cloud native config um, repo. And now let's go to one of the uh, multi uh, one of the of the files inside the Kubernetes file inside this repository. And as you can see, I can I have a view for what exactly is going on. So yeah, we just talked about like ed education, and I think this is part of it, right? Because if, for example, we have a privileged pod, it's not enough to say okay, it's just a privileged pod but it's very nice if we can get a context to the problem okay like what's the issue is what's the impact of the issue as we already talked about this in this uh, talk uh, but and also how you can fix it um and so this is like the our uh get our integration with uh, the um, um with git and what we already what we also have is an option to scan everything locally from your environment. So I'm going to run SNIC uh, infrared code test, and I also can see the uh, results of my local files. So again, both um, the CLI and the regular input flow of SNIC. So thank you all for listening. Uh, I really enjoyed. And I hope that you enjoyed as well. And, and I think that now we have time for some questions. If there are any questions, yay. Okay. Um, just a second. Uh, first question, will we talk about OpenShift? And the answer is no. Uh, sorry for that um another question so uh we have a question about does the attack vector will work on openshift openshift or only in vanilla uh, kubernetes and i think you, you know like the the point for uh just a second the point for this presentation was to talk only about the the core um the core uh, um the concept of kubernetes maybe part of them will not work i i think that you know the the privilege example the privilege pod example will be different in openshift but the memory the resource limitation uh problem is will definitely be as part of openshift as well um So we have another question. Uh, Pre-built Docker images from Docker Hub is mostly privileged. Uh, Kubernetes security context can fix can fix it in the container level using uh, run as user. Um, I'm not sure I follow the the question. So if you can make if you can clarify that on the chat as well. Thanks. Um, Uh, so, so another question, um, uh, if you can get the resources uh, related to the, the demo, I will be happy to share the YAMLs and the Docker files after this, uh, uh, this talk as well. I'll make sure it happens. And, whoa, too many questions. Uh, how to run untrusted application with patches third-party dependencies from internet inside pod running in on-prem Kubernetes cluster, uh, Docker at runtime. Um, can you uh, clarify what exactly the question is? Thanks. Um, Thanks all for the good feedback. And I'm not sure if I can provide exactly the same GitHub repo that I just saw, but again, I'm gonna share the examples as well for sure. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, the SNCC infrastructure is code scan. Uh, you can try it for free. Um, and basically uh, all SNCC products as a free, um, 
a free uh, a free version so you you can try snake infrastructure as code for free as well and and i think that right now we have 300 tests per month uh free for infrastructure as code so yeah definitely gonna uh, try it out Uh, a question if the tool that I just uh, demoed will find errors and provide suggestion to, to fix the, the error. So yeah, as I just uh, uh, demonstrated, uh, the purpose is to, to have a, a list of all the issues, but not only that, also to, to give you uh, some explanation how you can fix it and what's the problems part of it. And uh, interesting question from anonymous uh, person. If someone has access to the cluster, can they just change YAML files and privilege and privileges? Uh, I'm not sure uh, in the example you showed us if it's a separate terminal to execute the, the attack. So again, like add only a separate terminal just to, to to show what exactly is going on inside the pod, not as the attacker. But as for the, the first question, so it, it depends what does it mean that the, that the attacker is an access to the cluster. If they have an access only to the pod itself or to one of the pods, um, so it depends what's the, what's the configuration of your cluster. So, of course, that may be possible to somehow get an access to the to the YAML files, for example. Um, but if not, and in most of the cases, I guess it's very easy because there, it, like the, the deployment environment and the source code environment is is kind of a different environment from from your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So in most of the cases, it's 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 not doable, or at least it's very hard. But I think that the core concept is even if they have an access. If they, even if the attacker have an access to the cluster, you need to make sure that they can do the least as possible as part of this access. And hope I an answer the question. Um, so right now we are, we don't have any automatic uh, automatic fix for those issues, uh, but we are working on that at the moment. So stay tuned. And again, uh, same question. I'm gonna I'm gonna share a part of the configuration I just talked about uh, in this uh, um, like very soon after this talk. Um, Nice question of where I can learn more about Kubernetes. Very good, very good question. I like it. Um, I can say about myself that you know I learned like most of my experiences just by playing with Kubernetes, and and I think that you know lots of good podcasts about uh, about Kubernetes and how you can use it, but also uh, like very good um, like. Uh, uh, courses that you can take as well if you don't have any context at all. Uh, but again, my recommendation: just start playing with that. Uh, I think that if you know, if I will share the uh, some resources after this conversation, after this talk, so you, uh, I think it will be a very very good start. Any other question? Um, another anonymous question, uh, how to do pod sandboxing in Kubernetes cluster. So I'm not sure, like, um, I'm not sure there is any similar, uh, like concept for sandboxing, not that I'm familiar with. Um, but again, I think that in most of the cases, at least what you can do is try to make sure that like the pods that you have um inside your cluster are uh, like don't have all the privilege all, all the privileges 
uh, all the capabilities and and then like if they don't have any um any options for that so even if then an attacker has an access to the uh to the to your cluster they can basically do nothing they maybe they can you know ruin your pod maybe they can kill your the pod but they can do nothing outside of the pod um question about the uh, vulnerable uh, application with the recent limitation uh, is there any other way to handle the uh, vuln or just limit the uh, the memory um you know probably you know as part of the demo i saw i explained it are two different uh, problems here the first one is what was kind of a given just for the demo of the of the like the and the vulnerability for the attacker to use more resources. Uh, so for this one, you know, just fix the vulnerability, just make sure you, uh, you don't have those kind of vulnerabilities as part of your application. Um, and for the second part, even if you have those kind of vulnerabilities, so yeah, you can, you can uh, I think it will be enough for you to start with uh, memory limitation. Um, is there, is there any way to inspect the pod for anomalous behavior? Um, I think there are like multiple uh, products that might help you. I don't want to enter this as part of this application, sorry. Um, and uh, another question about Sneak, uh, is it open source? Uh, so we do have uh, several repositories. For example, our CLI is open source. Uh, but not everything as part, as part of our company is open source. And I think this is it. I hope that I answered all the questions. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Or. That was awesome. Thanks so much for everyone participating in all the great questions. That was great. As a reminder, the presentation will be posted on the Linux Foundation YouTube page um, in the next 24 hours. So we look forward to reviewing with you there. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.